Thanks for joining us this morning for a beginner beekeeping q and I'm just looking in the windows of this hive to see if we've got any honey to harvest while we answer your questions. If you've got questions in the comments below and Bija will read them out and we'll answer them. So if you have a look in here, there's capping on the honeycomb. That's what you want to see before you harvest. The bees have done their amazing work. They've filled the uh, cells with their nectar, they've waxed up all the flow frame parts, they've, they've uh, reduced the water content down to, to form honey and then they've put their wax capping over the top and that's when you know it'll keep because the bees put their wax capping like the lid on a preserving jar because they know that the honey will then keep for years like that should they need to store it. Lucky for us, they make more than they need often and we can share some too. So let's go ahead and tap some honey from that frame while you think of your questions. Just put them in the comments below. My father and I invented the, the flow hive and all of you out there who um, shared our video around the world, it was amazing to, to be received, um, have the invention received so well and have now over 100,000 beekeepers all around the world. So we've got a global community, which is fantastic. And if you have the answers to people's questions, by all means, chime in. Sometimes I don't have the best answer for you because I'm not in the location where you are. But often somebody near you will help answer the questions. So chime in, that's a wonderful thing. Now, what I'm gonna do first is just have a look at the, the back of the hive here. Now, we've harvested a lot from this hive, so there's not much left in here. But I can see that in the side window, the honey is still capped in this frame. And if I look around the end, we've still got some honey showing. And there's not a whole lot of honey coming in. So we'll just harvest one frame and leave whatever they're starting to store in there for the bees. Any questions, put it in the comments. First of all, I'm going to take the little cap out of the top and the one out of the bottom. A little hint there. If that's a little bit hard to get out, then you might want to use this little tongue here just to lever the cap out. A little tip there. Now um, you can see the bees have blocked up that leak back point, which is there. They've put some propolis down there. The little tongue there will clear that out for you. So it'll remain clear afterwards for any remaining dribbles to go back for the bees. So make sure you give that a good wiggle, push that in, and it's doing a job of clearing that little point. The jar goes underneath like that and then we're going to get our key and just insert it into the bottom slot. There's two slots there you can see. So we're going to go into the bottom one. And if you want to harvest a little bit we'll just insert the key part way and give that a turn like that. Now it will be firm to turn because you're breaking the wax and propolis if you like in all of that honeycomb to create channels inside the comb. If you do it in segments like that, it's just a bit easier to turn the key. See there, you've still got a fair bit of pressure. If it's too hard, just do it in smaller segments. And then you can go in all the way till you feel the knock at the back like that. Turn it back to a 90. And now what we're doing is harvesting all the honey in this frame. So a lot of the capping stayed intact in a couple of little spots. You can see that it's torn. But the bees are just going about their business. They uh, hardly know that anything's changed. Meanwhile, the honey is starting to drip down inside the comb and it's just starting to come out the tube now. So that honey will pick up speed. It's been a bit of a cold night and it's the edge frame. So it probably will move a little slower today. Are there any questions coming in? Yeah, we have a few questions already. Uh, Adrian from the Facebook Live wants to know, is there a way to make sure your hive does not swarm other than splitting the hive? Okay, there is a number of techniques to do with what's called spring management. And yes, splitting your hive, that is my favourite method because if you don't want another colony, somebody else surely will and you get to give the gift of bees to an, another beekeeper to get started and that definitely alleviates a lot of pressure in the hive. The two triggers are basically overcrowding in the bottom box 
which means the queen doesn't have anywhere to lay. So if there's nowhere for the queen to lay in the bottom and there's a lot of bees in the hive, you see that the window will be totally full of bees, then uh, that might trigger your swarm to do what they do naturally and half of them will leave to start a new colony. So that's just their natural thing to do, right? So what you want to do is reduce congestion in the bottom box. So taking a split, as you mentioned, is one way to do it. Another one is to put some blank frames back towards the center. So if you're pulling apart your bottom box here, you might actually take some of the honeycomb frames out and you can enjoy eating them and then put some fresh ones back in the middle and that will really give some new real estate for the queen to lay in and alleviate the primary swarm trigger. So that's a good one to do. Another thing you can do is add another brood box or another super, any of that will help relieve congestion in the hive in the springtime and mean that your hive is less likely to swarm. Look at that beautiful honey, I'm gonna to have to taste that. It's picking up speed now. Okay, we have another question from Zachary. Zachary wants to know if they can alter the taste of the honey by planting different flowers near the beehive. You certainly can, but you have to bear in mind a hive like this could visit 50 million flowers in a day, which is absolutely extraordinary. So you have to plant a lot of flowers if you actually want to get a honey crop from the flowers you plant. A hive will be spreading itself out over usually about a, a three kilometer radius or even up to 10 if they're hungry and bringing all of that nectar back into your hive. It's almost like a super organism. If you view it as a sort of a group consciousness, a super organism that can spread itself out and bring all the food back in again. And so that means that you'll need to plant quite a bit of forage to actually make a difference to your honey. But if you've got a bit of land, then you certainly can, and you can plant species that have medicinal value as well. A lot of people are doing that to get uh, medicinal properties like the manuka into their honey, and that way they can actually get a, uh, a higher price for their honey as well. And you can also just plant flowers like we have in the garden bed. The reason why we plant flowers like this here is not so much that it's going to make a difference to honey production, but it actually, you get this joy of watching all the native bees in, in the garden. And now it's a bit early in the morning here and it's a little bit cool, but the native bees actually will come and they really benefit from having a small flower garden because their range might only be, let's say, a, a 200 metre range. So they're often a solitary bee just making a, a, a few eggs in a, in a little tube or a hole in the mud or something like that. And they're really relying on consistent flowers. So if you plant flowers in your urban backyard, you might just be creating a stepping stone for the, that species to then reach further abroad, creating corridors between the wild spaces. So really important to plant habitat and do it for the native bees rather than the European honeybee. Oh, look at that, that jar's filling up now with beautiful honey. Look at the color of it. It's just gorgeous to watch it fill the jar. I never get sick of watching the honey just fill. We often have a little game to see if you can switch this without spilling a drop. Let's see how we go. Oh. Oh, failed. There you go. I think probably got a 5 out of 10 for that one. But I get to taste it. <laughs> Questions? Vanessa on the Facebook Live would like to know if you can show a Varroa mite alcohol wash being done and walk people through it for the states in Australia that haven't had to do them yet. Yep, okay. We have uh, put out videos of how to do that by other people. And, um, but yes, thanks for your suggestion there. If you've got suggestions of what you'd like us to cover, by all means, um, uh, chime in and let us know. And we'll dig out that link for you as well. We have a question from Amber. Um, she's in Michigan. She lost her queen last week when the hive swarmed, she's ordered a new queen, did an inspection this evening and all the comb is filled with honey. Will the workers move it so the queen has room to lay eggs? 
the new frames are not completely drawn out yet. Okay, so we've got new frames in some new frames in the bottom box, but all the rest of them are completely full. So that gets called honey bound in a hive. So if sometimes you have just full of honey here and there is no space for the queen to lay, and that is a, a swarm trigger, uh, especially in springtime, or mainly in springtime, is when bees will want to swarm. So um, you can help them by manipulating the frames and giving them some extra space, but if all of the frames aren't drawn out yet, i.e. they either haven't created all of the wax in all of the brood frames here, then there's still plenty of space for the queen to start laying. They'll draw that comb very quickly if they need to. So you can probably just leave them to it and as you say, they will move honey around and they'll even move it from the bottom box to the top box as well if they need to. Unlikely your hive's going to swarm because they've, it already has and there's be a bit of a dip in the population. So you can probably just leave the bees to sort that one out. Mm, look at that, yum. So Daniel would like to know if they can take honey from the hive if it's full just before going into winter. Okay. Um, depends where in the world you are. Um, let us know where you are in the world and also if you're a beekeeper in that area then help by answering whether the, the winter time is a good time for flowers in your area. Here where we are in the subtropics the winter actually gets more flowers than the autumn or late summer. So here we can harvest honey in the winter time like we are doing now but in other areas you get a long period without flowers and sometimes even knee deep snow and things like that in which case you wouldn't be harvesting honey just prior to the winter. So uh, you must be in the southern hemisphere if you're talking about the, the, the winter now. So uh, if you're down south say towards Victoria, Tasmania then you wouldn't be harvesting now. If you're sort of uh, north of Sydney and particularly on the coast you'll get a lot of flowers. Um, if you're on the coastal east coast or north of there then you can probably uh, harvest honey during the winter time as well. Another question from the Facebook Live. Roberto wants to know what type of bees we use. So these are a bit of a mix. You can, you can have a look here and the bees are busy starting to do their work. You can see the honey draining out from beneath the capping and the capping uh, lightening up, you can see the dark uh, comb here which has still got honey in it and the lighter comb up the top. Really cool to see. These bees are what is commonly re referred to as the Italian bee. I'm just looking at that. The, the lighter golden coloured ones are usually the Italian bee. The, the darker ones that don't have much gold on them at all are what's called Caucasians. There's all sorts of breeds of bee though. So it'll often be quite a mix in your hive because the queen has mated with multiple drones from different hives. So you get a lot of different genetics in one hive, but they are the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, and that is the species that humans have dragged all around the world with them because they're amazing at not only honey production, but pollination, which has become an integral part of our food chain. There are some subspecies uh, like Apis um, serrana, uh, the Asian honeybee, which you can get to use the flow hive too. They're a smaller bee with brighter patterns on the back. Um, also the Cape honeybee from South Africa has successfully worked with the uh, flow hive and also Africanized bees. Mmm, yum. Beautiful honey. So we have a lot of questions coming in from Instagram as well. The first question is, when should you expect honey after adding the super? So that will all depend and it often takes a bit of patience, but sometimes it's very quick as well. So if you've got a strong colony of bees, so when you open the window, you're seeing lots of bees in the window like this, and there's a good nectar flow. The flowers have a lot of nectar. So that typically happens in the springtime, but also can ha happen at other times of the year. And if those two things coincide, then you might find you harvest all your honey and it fills back up again in a week. 
and that's sort of w when you've got an extremely favourable scenario happening. But you also might find on the other end of the extreme, you might not get honey that season because perhaps there's been some environmental effects, fires or floods or things that have upset the flowering routine of the plants and you might not get any flowers at all or well, not enough to really store uh, meaningful amounts of honey. So uh, on average you could say um, you might be waiting some months before you get honey stored in your flow frames. Another question from Instagram, how do the bees get up into the flow frames? Will they figure this out for themselves? Mine are making a comb in the frames still. They haven't put their honey in the super yet. Okay, yes, a little bit of patience is needed there. And the things have to align as we were just talking about with the numbers of bees and the nectar flow. Sometimes you can get a hive that just doesn't do well for a season while you might have a couple of other hives that are doing great. So it can be genetics as well. But more often than not, you're just waiting for a good nectar flow which will stimulate the queen to lay more which will then uh, allow a lot more forager bees in the hive which then there's excess storage happening for you to share some as well. So a bit of patience needed. You can hurry things up a little bit if you want to if you're getting impatient by scraping some burr comb off the top of the frames, just extra comb they've made on top of the brood frames. Get that with your hive tool and you're mashing it into the flow frame surface. Put that flow frame in the window side, enjoy watching them recycle that wax in that local area and that will just get them started on that area quicker. However, you won't get any honey, honey storage until there's a good nectar flow. So patience is probably the biggest factor. Another question from Instagram. They just got their second flow hive. How far apart should they keep the two hives? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Now, the distance we've got them here is not a bad distance. The reason why we've left a bit of space between them is so we can view the window and so, the, so we can stand in between to do our brood inspections. So you don't want to go much closer than this if you've got a row of flow hives because you do need to take this box off and do your brood inspections and you need room around the hive to do that. However, as far as the bees are concerned, they don't care whether their hives are right up against each other or far apart. They'll know which hive to go to. So commercial beekeepers will often put four hives to a pallet just wall to wall. So don't worry about having them too close or too far apart. It's just more for practical reasons for you as the beekeeper to service your hive and look in the windows and so on. If you want to eliminate drift between hives, and that's when you have them in a row like this, you will get some sharing of bees. Let's say they come home loaded with nectar and pollen. They've got almost the whole body weight. The wind's blowing from this way. They're coming in from this direction and they're trying to get up to the end hive and they just don't have the energy. So they just go into the nearest hive. And a hive will accept a foreign bee that doesn't have the correct scent as long as it's got some gold, some nectar and pollen. So you get a bit of drift between the hives and often beekeepers who are, who are managing hives commercially will find the downwind hives get more honey for that particular reason. So if you don't want drift between the hives, which does share pathogens between them, then put them more than 10 metres apart. So uh, a few options there for you. Another question from Instagram, what do you do if you want to eat honeycomb with your hives? So there's a few options with a flow hive for honeycomb. One is you can do your spring management, pull a bit of honeycomb out of the brood box and you can simply just find one of the frames at the edge that usually is all honeycomb and cut a big section out with a knife and you can enjoy watching the bees fill that back in again. If you've got a wedding coming up, you can cut a big heart out, take that to the wedding on a cheese plate or whatever it is. Um, things like that are fun to do. Or you can take the whole frame out if you've got another frame to switch it with. But beautiful thing with naturally drawn comb is you can just cut it out and put the frame straight back in. Another thing you can do is collect honey in the roof. Now if you take the cap out from underneath here, you will find that the bees will build honey in this roof cavity. 
which is fun for a while, but then gets a bit messy when you pull the roof off, you're breaking a lot of honeycomb and having a, a bit of clean up. So what I would suggest doing is confine them to a small area in there just by upturning, say, a Pyrex uh, baking dish or something like that over that hole and just watch them build in that smaller area so you can still lift the roof off easily. That's another way to go. Or you can add another box specifically for collecting honeycomb and that's something that beekeepers do as well. Going back to the Facebook Live, we have a question here asking how much the hive costs. Okay, we'll put some links in below, but if you go to honeyflow.com, it'll redirect you to your local store, the closest one to you, and you can get all of the, uh, the prices there for the flow hives. There's a few different options. We've tried to make it affordable um, with some more basic features right through to um, all the bells and whistles like you, you see here with all of the details and ant guards and uh, brass features and pest management trays and all of those things that make it a bit easier, but any of the flow hives will be a great way to start. Okay, any more questions? Just put them in the comments below today. It's beginner beekeeping, so no such thing as a silly question. Just chime in, let us know um, what you might have been afraid to ask. Sometimes out there in the world um, you might find places where people don't want to hear beginner questions. Here we want to hear them, we want to hear all your beginner questions. Doesn't matter how uh, silly they might be, just put them in the comments and we can help you get started. We have a question from Roberto. They have stingless bees in Phil, I'm assuming it's Philadelphia. Can they still use the flow hive? So stingless bees, uh, I'll just, I'm not sure about your ones in Philadelphia, but here in Australia we have little stingless bees, um, which are like little tiny flies. And we actually have the oldest living culture here of honey harvesters in, in the world because we've, we've still got people harvesting honey from them here in Australia in the traditional ways, which they, they will um, tie a little uh, hair or a feather to the bee that they find and then they'll follow it all the way back to its nest, rip the tree apart and take out the honeycomb. But they have a completely different nest structure. They've got more like a spiral-like grape structure in them, which while you could make a mechanism to harvest in a similar way, perhaps, uh, it's probably not worth it because the amount of honey they produce is so small and you might only be able to harvest half a kilogram or maybe a kilogram of honey a year from a hive like that. Whereas one like this, you could harvest 20 or 40 kilograms of honey from a year. So the answer probably is you wouldn't bother making a fancy mechanism like this. Okay, we have a question from YouTube. Taylor from Sydney wants to know how much honey you can harvest in one flow hive and how much you need to leave for the bees for their winter without feeding them with sugar water? Okay, great question. So here we are coming, where we're just into our winter now. And in Sydney, if you're right on the coast, you might get some flowers on the coast. If you're inland a bit, you're probably gonna have several months with no flowers. So good idea to leave now what is in there for the bees, unless you see it all filling up during the winter time, in which case, you might as well harvest some and make some room for them to keep filling. And with a flow hive, you can just harvest a small amount. Let's say you wanted a jar of honey for your family, but you weren't really sure whether they were or weren't going to bring in more honey. And what you can do is just harvest part of a frame. If this has one, two, three, four, five, six jars of honey, then you divide this into, into six here and you just put it in that fire and it'll be one jar of honey. So it'll be about that much, it'll be one jar of honey. You'd be inserting it in like that, turning it, and it would come out slowly because it's, it's only a portion of the frame, but you would get just a little bit of honey for your family while leaving the rest for the bees. Okay, going back to Instagram, we have a question asking, how would this system work in Canada where winter is long and quite snowy? 
would you need an indoor or moderated temperature area? It works wonderfully in Canada. We, one of the very first hives we sent out prior to our crowdfunding launch was to a Canadian beekeeper called John Gates. And he was a commercial beekeeper and he tested the flow hive and was absolutely amazed by it. And you'll see, see some of his um, quotes in the original crowdfunding video. And one of the um, amazing things is the honey production season, no matter where you are in the world, is the warmer times. So in Canada, it's very exciting that, that honey flow because you get this really long, cold winter, but then everything that is going to flower, flowers in a very short space of time. So the bees go absolutely berserk and you hear reports from Canada where they've filled a whole box in a day, which is just unheard of here. It's absolutely incredible. So bees in Canada will work wonderfully with the flow hive. It'll be the warmer times you're harvesting anyway. And then when you're wintering your hive to survive through to the next season, it'll be just the same as any Langstroth beehive. So you'll be taking the same precautions as you do in those cold areas to get your bees to survive through to the next springtime. Another question from Instagram. Can you show a frame that is full versus not full? Ah, yes. So um, let's have a look around and see what we can find. So this frame was full and you can still see the capping there beneath their feet. And it looks much like that when the frame is full. And However, the honey has drained out from beneath their feet. The bees are just cottoning on that something's changed and they're starting to chew away to recycle that wax. Now let's have a look in this window. Oh, not a whole lot going on. This hive's pretty quiet and that's what it looks like with an empty frame. Now this frame's been used a bunch of times. The bees have covered all the cells in wax, so it looks nice and waxy. So there you have an empty frame. You can see the hexagon cells and probably not even any nectar down those cells. And I'll see if I can find you another interesting example. Here's probably better light. You can see that um, comb, the bees have covered all those cells in wax. And there's a few bees getting around there, but really it's a cold morning and a lot of them are still downstairs. Can't see any nectar there either. But that's a, a, a show of an empty frame. Now, if you have a look at this one over here, this is an interesting example. This frame we harvested last week, last week and the bees are busy ripping off the capping, recycling that wax in that local area and repairing the cells ready to fill them again, doing a beautiful job. If there was a nectar flow on they would be in a hurry to get this capping off and make more room for storage and a busy hive would tear all the capping down, repair all the cells in a day and keep going. But I've found when there's not a nectar flow, they tend to be a bit lazy about it. They get about it in their own time and they just start uh, easy as you go, removing the capping. And after a while, they'll get to all the cells and start filling them with nectar again. Now at the back here, you get, get a beautiful view, but I don't actually have a view at the moment because there's not much honey coming in. These cells will look completely full when the, when the frame is nice and full and there is a good flow on. You'll see the capping down here, you'll see a lot of honey, you'll see different colours of honey in the hive. And if you dial back to the start of this video, you'll see there was some honey in the end frame view here. Now look, one bee got a bit carried away and jumped in the honey jar. Let's get that out and put it back on the entrance. They're fine, uh, to, they, they will um, survive perfectly well. But if you put them on the landing board, the other bees will clean them up very quickly. Have a look at this. When the bees come in, let's see if I can, oh, it doesn't want to leave. It's busy, it's busy getting a good old bit of honey there. Look, it's tongue licking, you can see 